welcome you to the 2022 Franciscan Zoom Lectures, hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Our presenter tonight, Dr. Sarah Colas, OSF, holds a master's degree from the Catholic Theological Union and doctorate from the Graduate Theological Union in Biblical Studies. She has taught classes as an adjunct at Loris College and Wartburg Theological Seminary in Dubuque and St. Mary's University in San Antonio. This past semester, she served as an instructor for FST's MTS program. She made her final profession as a sister of St. Francis of Dubuque in 2011. This fall, she begins a full-time position as an assistant professor of theology at Briarcliff University in Sioux City, Iowa. Her forthcoming publication, Creating Spaces for Women in the Catholic Church, a collaborative effort with eight laywomen, will be available in 2023. Check Amazon. She is currently working on scripture in times of disruption, which posits that we may understand the biblical text anew as it was written during times of disruption. I welcome Sister Sarah Colas. Thank you. I want to thank the Franciscan School of Theology for this invitation. It is not often that I am invited specifically to consider my study and research in scripture in light of a Franciscan perspective. Yet my formation in the Franciscan charism does inform my interpretation of scripture, both through the passages I think that capture my attention and the methods that I employ to interpret. So I am delighted and honored to have this opportunity to reflect on all of this with you. As we know, the term menorahs refers to the collective term for peasants or the lesser ones in the socioeconomic stratum of the 12th century Assisi commune in which Francis of Assisi lived. Society was divided into the noble class or the major ones and then the peasants who were the minor ones. Of course, there was a rising merchant class as well. Francis sought to follow Christ who became poor and humble like us. Thus, Francis adopts a posture of humility in his relationship with God, others, and all of creation. For our first order brothers, this menorahs or humility is their primary charism. We must never desire to be above others, but instead we must be servants and subjects to every human creature for God's sake, uh, the second letter to the faithful tells us. Part of living menorahs includes not seeking power over others, but choosing instead to be vulnerable with others. And from the canticle of the creatures, we hear praise and bless my Lord, give thanks and serve God with great humility. The theme of humility is present throughout France, throughout Franciscan writings, knowing who we are before God, continually praising God, and recognizing our dependence on God is part of Franciscan menorahs. Claire, too, embraces the role of servant, eager to care for any sister in need. She lived Jesus' injunction in John 13 to imitate Jesus through acts of loving service to adopt the lesser position as a way of life in following Jesus by washing her sister's feet. And finally, from the third order rule, everywhere and in each place and in every season and each day, may we have a true and humble faith. Third order Franciscans also value menorahs as humility is found throughout our third order rule in life. Of course, this is just a sampling of where this idea shows up in our Franciscan tradition. Finally, Ilia Delio in The Humility of God writes, Bonaventure views the life of Francis as a growth in awareness of divine goodness at the heart of the world in and through the mystery of Christ. His story is framed by Francis's encounter with the crucified Christ. 
In encountering Christ crucified, Francis met the God of humble love. This meeting became the basis of encountering God in the particularity of every other where the humility of God was expressed in ordinary human flesh. So thus we encounter God in our human limitations and vulnerabilities. That which appears to us as weakness or lesser is precisely where we know we encounter God, not in the grand moments and events, but in the everyday ordinary encounters. Franciscans are called not only to see the ordinary, the humble and the vulnerable in society, but we are also called to choose to be ordinary and vulnerable in our lives. Francis of Assisi and his followers called themselves the lesser brothers. They strive to live humbly and in right relationship to all. What happens when we bring the Franciscan value of menorahs to the interpretation of scripture? How might our understanding of the biblical text shift when we read with minor characters? in our sacred text. Jenna Hens Piazza is a scripture scholar at the Jesuit School of Theology, and she's recently written a book entitled The Supporting Cast of the Bible, Reading on Behalf of the Multitude. Hens Piazza prefers the term supporting cast rather than minor characters, and objects to the term minor, as minor indicates that, that these characters are less important less significant or less worthy of our attention as readers. Instead, Hens Piazza challenges us to be aware that if we read past characters in the biblical text, pass over them or neglect to consider their concerns because they are deemed insignificant or minor, then we are also in danger of reading past, ignoring, or neglecting real life people with, val with valid concerns. In this inverted world of following the gospel embraced by Francis of Assisi, being minor is not a negative, but something to be sought after. Therefore grounded in my Franciscan formation, I have no dislike of the term minor characters. To follow the path of menorahs minority, the lesser, the humble ones, is to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Thus, as a Franciscan reading scripture, I would suggest that turning to the characters at the margins of the pages of the Bible is akin to placing our efforts at the service of those on social or economic margins of society. Jenna lists a few, this is no, by no means exhaustive, Jenna Hens Piazza, of a few characteristics of minor characters or her supporting cast. Frequently, minor characters are unnamed. They are not usually featured in the story. They speak very little. Sometimes they don't speak at all. They may just show up suddenly in the text and then disappear. Minor characters may also be representative of individuals or groups. So the woman, the lepers, the crowd could be examples of minor characters. And minor characters can also include what she calls implied characters. And so for example, in John eight, which is the story we know as the woman who's caught in adultery, we know that it's not possible for her to be caught in adultery alone. And so, the man whom she would be involved with is an implied character in that situation. This is a meme created by one of my undergraduate students for a project that I think captures this idea very well of the sparrow. I may be small, but I'm kind of a big deal. And I thought it would be fun to share with you all. So let us turn to the scripture text. I've chosen a story that even the most avid readers of scripture will likely be unfamiliar with. I admit that I cannot recall reading this story prior to beginning my PhD studies. As I read the story, I will pause after some verses 
to explain the context a little bit more. And as we read through these slides of this passage in scripture, I invite you to pay attention and to notice as many minor characters as possible as we read along. And we'll consider what happens if we interpret the events of this story from different perspectives. And how does paying attention to the perspectives of minor characters shift our understanding? So we begin. Elisha replied, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, at this time tomorrow, a seah of fine flour will sell for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel in the market of Samaria. So for context, drought is a reoccurring problem in the narratives of Elijah and Elisha in first and second Kings. Too little water meant crops didn't grow and that there is not enough food to feed the population. Many Old Testament squabbles are over water or food security. In verse 25 of the previous chapter, we are told that the famine is so severe that a donkey's head sells for 80 pieces of silver. The prices of food are exorbitant and the prophet Elisha promises here with these prices about shekels and such that the prices will be back to normal very soon. And so on to verse two. But the app, but the adjutant upon whom the arm, excuse me, but the adjutant upon whose arm the king leaned answered the man of God. Even if the Lord were to make windows in the heaven, how could this happen? The ancient Near Eastern peoples believed there was a window, an opening in the heavens, which rain fell through to water the earth. Basically, he's asking, even if it rains, how will that help a starving city? Crops won't show up overnight. Elisha said, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. At the, at the city gate, four lepers were asking one another, why should we sit here until we die? If we decide to go into the city, we shall die there, for there is famine in the city. If we remain here, we shall die too. So come, let us desert to the camp of the Arameans. If they let us live, we live. If they kill us, we die. Now the lepers are outside the walls of the city. They were not likely welcomed within the city in good times, but now that the city is starving, they are fairly certain they will not survive upon entering the city. Out of desperate need for survival, they turn to the enemy camp for provisions, reasoning that if the enemy kills them, they were going to die anyway. At twilight, they left for the Arameans, but when they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. The Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses, the sound of a large army, and they had reasoned among themselves. The king of Israel has hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to fight us. Then in the twilight, they had fled, abandoning their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, the whole camp just as it was, and fleeing for their lives. So the Lord causes the Arameans to hear the sound of a large army approaching, and they flee in fear, leaving their animals behind. Now, this is rather comical. Who, would, who wouldn't take a horse to flee on horseback in order to get away faster? This is supposed to be comedy, I think. So after the lepers reached the edge of the camp, they went first into one tent, ate and drank, and took silver, gold, and clothing from it and went out and hid them. Back they came into another tent and took things from it and again went out and hid them. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This is a day of good news and we are keeping silent. If we wait until morning breaks, we will be blamed. 
So come, let us go and inform the palace. They came and summoned the gatekeepers. They said, we went out to the camp of the Arabians, but no one was there, not a human voice, only the horses and donkeys tethered and the tents just as they were left. The gatekeepers announced this and it was reported within the palace. Though it was night, the king got up and said to his servants, let me tell you what the Arameans have done to us. Knowing that we are starving, they have left their camp to hide in the field. They are thinking that Israelites will leave the city and we will take them alive and enter it. One of his servants, however, suggested, let some of us take five of the horses remaining in the city. They are just like the whole throng of Israel that has reached its limit. And let us send scouts to investigate. They took two chariots and horses and the king sent them to reconnoiter the Aramean army with the order, go and find out. They followed the, Arame the Arameans as far as the Jordan and the whole route was strewn with garments and other objects that the Arameans had thrown away in their haste. The messengers returned and told the king. The people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. And then a seah of fine flour sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. The king had put in charge the gate of the gate, the officer upon whose arm he leaned. But the people trampled him to death at the gate, just as the man of God had predicted when the messenger came down to him. This was in accordance with the word of the man of God had spoken to the king. Two seahs of barley will sell for a shekel and a say of fine flour for a shekel at this time tomorrow in the market of Samaria. The adjutant had answered the man of God, even if the Lord were to make windows in heaven, how could this happen? And Elisha had replied, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And that is what happened to him, for the people trampled him to death at the gate. So it is possible and worthwhile to dig deeper into the perspective of each of these characters. And so I've made here a list of minor characters that I have identified in the text. They include the adjutant or the officer upon whose arm the king leaned. The king also in this story is unnamed and seems to be treated as a more minor character. The four lepers, the starving inhabitants of the city, the Arameans, the kings of the Hittites and the Egyptians, the gatekeepers, the horses and donkeys, the servants of the king, and the messengers. So I've chosen three of the minor characters on this list to demonstrate how the interpretation of this narrative is deepened by exploring their perspectives. The first character. The, the adjutant or officer. This position likely entailed a great deal of responsibility. An advisor to the king, an administrative position, and someone upon whom the king relied. No one is, oh, excuse me, not only is this a time of famine in which people are starving, it is also a time of war. The city seems to be under siege and surrounded by the Arameans. This official upon whom the king relied likely heard the king's concerns, served as a sounding board for the leader, and was expected to be a source of advice and offer solutions during chaotic times when there were no clear solutions. Prophets could make all kinds of claims and sometimes said what kings wanted to hear. It didn't necessarily mean that their predictions would come true. Expressing skepticism when the sky was falling instead of rain was a natural response to this situation. This officer was probably looking for plausible solutions or at least temporary measures that could alleviate suffering and did not have time for magical thinking. He was probably amazed when he heard the prophet's words fulfilled and a solution 
for both problems the city faced, hunger and an enemy at the gates. This was probably the solution, any solutions to these problems was probably beyond his capacity to imagine. It seems unfair that he is trampled for daring to doubt the prophet's oracle. This character may lead us to wonder, what is it like to shoulder great burdens in chaotic times like these? Do we leave room to be delightfully surprised by unexpected possibilities, even in situations where we can see no way forward? Next, we have the lepers. However unnamed and minor the official upon whose arm the king leaned may have been, he did have a position of power as someone the king relied upon. By contrast, the lepers are on the bottom of any social order. Lepers were not welcome within the city. Elsewhere in Numbers 12, Miriam is sent out of the community for a week until her skin condition heals. The four lepers are truly lesser figures in this narrative. They are treated as a group and not as individuals. They are unnamed. When they speak, they seem to speak with one voice. They appear for a few verses perform their role, and then vanish from the story. Yet, it is these seemingly insignificant figures who dare to move into the enemy's camp, though we are told it is out of sheer desperation. The four lepers are the first to witness that the Lord has acted on behalf of the city. They are the first to experience abundance and relief from the famine. After delighting in the spoils, they turn back and announce the good news of the Lord's action on their behalf to the gatekeepers. They decide not only to think of themselves, but also the city, even if their reasoning was grounded in their own need for survival and not to be blamed. Their actions in announcing the good news led to an end of starvation in the city. The four lepers may have saved lives by not waiting as the situation within the city seems to be dire. We do not know what happened to them after their announcement. Were they treated as they were before? Were they still unwelcome? within the walls and the protection of the city? Were they rewarded in some way for the role that they play and the lives they may have saved? We do not know. But their characters also invite us to consider. When have we been the lesser ones, vulnerable and rejected? What is our experience of God's working through the most, uh, the most minor of characters in our lives? And when have we delighted in good news? I suspect when I added horses and donkeys to the list of potential minor characters, many of you hoped I would spend some time unpacking the horses and donkeys as characters. And since this is a Franciscan presentation, it seems appropriate that I oblige this unspoken request. Indeed, animals such as horses and donkeys rarely have a voice in the biblical narratives or elsewhere. They generally require humans to speak on their behalf or defend their interests and ensure their care. I say rarely and generally because there actually is a story 
about a talking donkey in the Bible. You can find it in Numbers 22.8, though that will not be our focus. In this narrative we have just read, the animals sadly do not speak, but they are present when the Lord causes the Arameans to hear the sounds associated with a large incoming army. Were the animals also disturbed by the loud sounds they were hearing? If they were not disturbed by the sounds, they would have likely picked up on the utter panic of the Arameans, the people who fed and cared for them. If they were abandoned and tied up while the Arameans were fleeing, were they bucking, stomping, and twisting around, attempting to flee as well? Did they calm again in the quiet that was left behind? They became some of the abundance left behind by the Arameans. Were they content with the new humans who cared for them? Do the horses and donkeys merely serve as additional unexpected wealth abandoned by the enemy that will aid a starving city? They too, are creatures who silently witness all that was unfolding. And they might lead us to question and consider. What do creatures witness today? What do they know of God's handiwork? And what actions of humans do they silently bear witness to? In conclusion, if we merely engage this unfamiliar biblical text by reading it at a surface level, then the main message of the text seems to be that we should listen to God's prophet and notice that God protects the city in chaotic times. This is not a bad message. However, there are so many more layers and so much more nuance to the narrative when we adopt reading the narrative through the perspective of minor characters or the supporting cast as Hint Piazza prefers. The officer of the king becomes more than an example of what could happen if you don't believe the Lord's words as spoken, to the, as spoken by the prophet. The officer reminds us that we too do not know what to do in chaotic times. The lepers remind us that God announces good news through the most vulnerable and that they lead us to wonder whether they were still treated poorly after their announcement of good news. They cause us to reflect on our treatment of the most vulnerable in society today. And the horses and donkeys remind us that creatures are too often treated as commodities, yet they silently bear witness to our actions. Thus reading with minor characters offers a multitude of fresh readings and we benefit and we are enriched and the story is deepened when we engage them all. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Collis. This opportunity is brought to you by the Franciscan School of Theology Development Department. Let us give Sarah a collective applause.